So why are we so exercised about exercise? And I think, I think there's several reasons. I think one of them is that there's a lot of confusing journalism. Just pick up the newspaper one day and you'll read that, you know, running is really good for you and then pick up the newspaper mm -hmm. another day and you'll read like about the famous Copenhagen heart study, which I describe in the book, which, which can tell you that, you know, running, especially fast, can be deadly. You know, one day you can read that you should be doing aerobic activity, it's the best thing, you know, and better than weights. And another day you can read that, you know, weights are really important for healthy aging. And, and that gives people whiplash. They wonder like, well, what should I believe? How should I do it? How should I start? How should I think about my own body? You know, what, what, what do we do in this modern world? I think another problem is that so much of the exercise literature is focused on weight loss. And that, you know, to a sense, to a certain degree, that makes sense because obesity is a huge problem around the planet. Um, and, um, and a lot of people exercise in order to lose weight. But, and, 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 but there's also a lot of controversy about it. So for example, there was this famous Time uh, uh, magazine cover a few years ago, which basically argued that exercise is really over, oversold because it doesn't really help you lose weight. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and, and another problem is that there's been an excess focus on elite athletes. You know, we read relentlessly in the paper about, you know, Olympic athletes and world-class athletes. But, but I think it's a bit like, you know, the focus on, on supermodels. You know, what do these folks have to do with uh, most of us who are simply trying to go for a five-mile jog or a 20-minute walk or something like that? And then finally, we have a Western post-industrial bias. If you look in the literature, you look in the major medical journals, you look in the major sports medicine journals, you look in the newspaper, almost all the information that we get comes from, well, people like me and probably like you, people who are from Western post-industrial uh, um, uh, populations, you know, Americans and Brits and Swedes and Australians. And yet the vast majority of the world aren't post-industrial Westerners. And in fact, for most of our evolutionary history, they obviously weren't post-industrial Westerners. And so focusing on that tiny little sliver of humanity gives us a very kind of unusual and biased view about what it is, how we use our bodies. And I think it's probably part of the problem with the whole, the barefoot thing. We think that wearing shoes is like normal and not and being barefoot is abnormal, but of course, from an evolutionary perspective, it's the other way around. And so I thought it would be fun to write a natural history. So, and, and with sort of two precepts, the first is that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, and nothing about humans makes sense except in the light of anthropology. Right? And so the, the book has four sections. And the first section is about inactivity, because if you want to understand activity, exercise, you first need to understand the flip side of that coin, which is inactivity. And the second part of the book is about speed and strength. Um, you know, the fact that we're not very fast and we're not very strong as, as creatures. The third part of the book is about endurance, so walking and running and dancing and things like that. And then the final part of the book is about how we apply that sort of natural history to health and disease in the modern world. And so the book weaves together evolutionary biology, anthropology, a lot of human biology, a lot of health and medical science. But I do that as much as I can with my own experiences, because for the last sort of 15, 20 years, I've been trying to experience different, different, um, you know, different ways in which people use their body in different cultures. So I've, you know, I've been racing against horses. I've been doing a lot of work in Africa. I've, I, did, I went to Greenland to go with some hunters. I've been working in Mexico. I've, I try carrying things in my head. I really try. Um, as much as I can to try to put myself in other people's shoes or, or not their shoes as the, as the case may be. And so that I can sort of understand at a more experiential level um, um, uh, what, they're, what they're doing with their bodies. And so the book has got 13 major chapters. And in each chapter, I decided to, to kind of organize each chapter around a different myth about exercise. Because again, my, my general theory is that, or my general sort of feeling is that we're very exercised about exercise and there are a lot of myths. And so um, if you'll permit me, I'll spend the next um, you know, few minutes going through some of the, the basic myths, kind of a, a teaser for the book. I obviously don't have time to go into, into detail about any one of the myths, and, um, but if you, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll buy the book and, and you can read in detail um, uh, what I'm just gonna kind of outline here super briefly. So the first section of the book is about inactivity, right? Because after all, uh, you can't exercise all the time and, and, and humans evolved to, to rest even more than we evolved uh, to be physically active. And indeed, that's the very first myth, which is what I call the myth of the athletic savage, the idea that we evolved to exercise. Um, and it is true that our ancestors and hunter-gatherers today, and when we go out and study people in different parts of the world, are reasonably physically active. So if you go to study hunter-gatherers uh, in, in Africa, 
that, you know, they, the, the bread and butter is walking and carrying, right? They walk a lot, they carry a lot. Sometimes they run, they spend a lot of time digging, sometimes they dance. And if you look at the data, it turns out that they're, they're physically active around two and, two and a quarter hours a day. But importantly, they're only physically active when it's necessary or it's fun, like for example, dancing. Um, most of the time, if you go into camp, they're sitting, right? Um, and that makes sense uh, because, you know, when, you, when energy is limited, it, to go for a five mile jog in the morning is a crazy thing to do. You're just wasting energy um, uh, that you could otherwise use for other important tasks. So, so the idea that people in, in different cultures, like even the Taramara, you know, get up in the morning and, you know, stretch their arms and decide, I, I think I'm going to go for a 50 mile run today. I mean, nobody does that. That's a completely modern, bizarre and strange thing to do. There's nothing wrong with it, but, but it's not, it's, it's a luxury that most people I can't afford and wouldn't even dream of doing it until, until recently. So that kind of ties into the second myth, which is that it's unnatural to be, to be lazy, right? Um, and, and the reason for that is because of trade-offs. So if you think about the equation of life, life is really about getting energy in the form of food and then using that energy to have babies. So it's a food in and babies out. But of course, to do that, you have to allocate energy to different tasks. So you spend some of that energy on growing your body, you spend energy on maintaining your body. You spend, of course, some of that extra energy if you have it on storing fat. Um, you, of course, spend energy on reproduction. And then finally, we have to spend some energy on physical activity. But anytime you spend a calorie on one thing, you can't spend a calorie on something else. So there are inevitable trade-offs. And natural selection cares ultimately about one thing and one thing only, which is how many offspring you have who survive and reproduce. So anytime you can spend less energy on growth or maintenance or physical activity and plow that energy into reproduction, natural selection is going to favor that. And indeed, that's the case. So humans evolved to be physically active just enough to, to enable them to reproduce as much as possible. But any physical activity that's, that doesn't benefit those, you know, ultimately doesn't benefit reproduction, is going to be selected against. So, so it's not that we're lazy. It's that we evolved to not expend unnecessary physical activity. So as, as I said before, we're physically active. We evolve to be physically active when it's necessary or when it has some kind of social and rewarding benefit, like dancing, for example, for social reasons. Which leads into the, the third myth, which is, which is really the, the idea that maybe people have heard about, which is that sitting is the new smoking. Right? It's intrinsically unhealthy. And you know, I've been worried about this, this, this idea for a long time because I've spent a lot of time in, in different sort of subsistence populations in different parts of the world, in Africa and, and Central America and other places. You know, like for example, this is a hunter-gatherer camp I walked to, into, in, into in Tanzania a few years ago. This is, the, this is literally what I saw as I walked into the camp. There are these, all these folks, they're just looking at me like, who is this guy? And look at them, they're all sitting. And it turns out some, some, a recent paper from actually some former students of mine showed that on average in these hunter-gatherer camps, people sit on average about nine hours a day, uh, which is actually not that much different from what Westerners sit. Maybe, maybe this guy sits more than nine hours a day, but you know, in countries like the United States and England, people sit between about nine to 12 hours a day. And it turns out that what's not so bad is sitting, it's just uninterrupted sitting. So if you sit for long periods of time without getting up and also kind of less active sitting, so the, the way these folks sit by, you know, by squatting or not having back support, et cetera, uh, makes the way that they sit intrinsically healthier. So sitting in itself is not unhealthy. It's sitting without being physically active for the rest of the day. And also there's some differences in the way in which we sit. And again, uh, you'll have to read the, the book to, to, to get uh, more of those details. And of course that made me wonder, you know, if we're told to sit less, why are we also told to sleep more? I mean, I grew up thinking that we needed eight hours of sleep. And I was really surprised as I, as I started uh, researching this, that, that actually there's not a lot of evidence in, in favor of the eight hours of sleep. Now, I don't wish to trivialize the fact that sleep is very important and people who don't get enough sleep do suffer some negative consequences, but eight hours is, a, is basically a myth. In fact, people have been studying subsistence populations, people who don't have electricity, so people who don't have iPhones and, and televisions and computers and, and whatever, all those things that, that supposedly uh, prevent us from sleeping, but it turns out that populations where people don't have uh, that kind of technology, they sleep on average between 5.7 and 7.1 hours a night. So the idea that sort of modern sort of electrified technology has caused us to sleep less is just not true. And in fact, if you start looking at the epidemiological data, um, nowhere can you find any evidence that eight hours is, is optimal for the average person. Now, there's, of course, there's a lot of variation around the mean, but this is a study, for example, of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, the ratio of heart disease against how much they sleep. 
And you can see that the optimal amount of sleep for most people turns out to be around seven. Now, of course, there are some people who, whose optimal amount of sleep is eight. You know, of course, when you're younger, more sleep is important. As you get older, sleep becomes less important. So there's variation around that mean, but the idea that eight hours is somehow some kind of natural optimum that we all used to get just turns out not to be true uh, in the slightest. Okay, so that's inactivity. I think we have a lot of myths about inactivity. What about speed and strength? So, so one idea about speed, of course, that's I think very common, and I think people understand, recognize this, is that we're a generally slow species, right? When we got off having four legs to having only two legs, that means you can only produce you know, power with half the number of pistons, basically. And it is true that Usain Bolt here, who's the fastest, still the fastest guy on the planet in terms of records, um, you know, he can run 10.4 meters a second, which is fast for a human, but it's really pretty mediocre for a mammal. In fact, the vast majority of animals out there, quadrupeds, could easily outrun Bolt, both in terms of speed as well as distance. But Bolt is pretty exceptional. And we tend to think that you know, there's a kind of a trade-off, not only that humans are slow, which is, that is true, but there's also a trade-off between speed and endurance. And I think this is a perfect example of how we focus on elite athletes. So, so here's Bolt, who's the, the world's best marathoner. This is Elliot Kipchoge, excuse me, a best sprinter, this is Elliot Kipchoge, who's the world's best marathoner. And Kipchoge is running a marathon at 5.9 meters a second. That's a 440 mile, right? That's extraordinary. <laughs> Very few people watching this, maybe nobody watching this can run a 440 mile. So he's able to run a marathon in just a little bit over two hours. If, um, and, whereas Bolt can run 100 meters in, in less than 10 seconds. So if, if, they were, if Bolt were actually able to run a marathon at, at, um, um, at his speed, he would actually run a 107 marathon, and if Kipchoge were running 100 meters at his speed, he'd be running a pretty dismal 1657. So people think that there's this kind of trade-off, and indeed it makes sense for, for Bolt versus, versus, versus Kipchoge, but it's not true for the rest of us. I mean, how many of us can, as I said before, can run a 440 mile? These guys, Kipchoge is running really incredibly fast for an incredibly long distance. Um, and, 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 and I think that, and in fact, it turns out that if you want to increase your endurance, one of the best ways to do that is to do what's called high intensity interval training, because it, it, it actually builds endurance by, by doing speed. So you do these kind of intervals of high speed workouts, and then you kind of rest and you kind of relax. And the way that functions is it actually stresses certain uh, components of your aerobic system, and, and that stress builds up capacity. And again, uh, I describe that process and how it works and why it works that way um, in quite a bit of detail uh, in the book. Another myth about speed and strength is that we evolved to be really strong. Um, I think it's pretty common if you go to, you know, <clears throat> in the CrossFit world, but there's this just general idea that cavemen were really strong. But if you think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. First of all, humans evolved weapons a long time ago, so we don't really need the kind of strength that we used to because we have technology. But the other is that muscle is really expensive. Muscle is about, you know, 30, 40% of your body weight, but muscles are really costly um, uh, tissue. And so having more muscle than you need actually requires you to have, to ingest more calories than that would be easy to get. And it turns out that when you actually measure strength in hunter-gatherers, they turn out to be not particularly strong. They're, this is a graph of, of grip strength. It's one measure of strength of, of people in the United Kingdom over age, over time, and you can see in their 20s to 40s, they tend to be the most strong. Hunter-gatherers are reasonably strong, but they're not crazy strong. They're not stronger than your typical, you know, reasonably, you know, fit English person. But as you can see, as they age, they tend to keep their strength better than, than average Westerners, because of course, they're still using their bodies. They're not retiring. They're not, they're not, um, they're not losing their strength as they get older. And then, and then in this section, the sort of final myth that I explore in this section is the idea that sports somehow equals exercise. You know, for me, as I said before, when I was a kid, when I was, when I was exercise, when I was on a team, I most, mostly spent my time doing what these kids are doing, who are sitting on the bench, because I, I was terrible. I wasn't very good at scoring goals, you know, so I just sat and watched my, my more athletic classmates uh, run around while I sat on the sideline. And, and indeed, if you think about the, the Olympics, for example, uh, that both the old Olympics as well as the modern Olympics, a lot of the the, the sports that, that we have in the Olympics are really about, about, about speed and strength, and, and they're often um, um, activities that are really important for fighting. And some of the most important and popular uh, athletic activities, some of them disturbing like bullfighting, others also disturbing and extremely popular in the United States like, like football, 
Um, or this is the, um, I described this wonderful game that play, that's played every year in Florence called the, the Calcio Florentino. But, but a lot of sports um, are actually uh, more about, about fighting than they are about actually getting exercise. And, and I describe in the book how uh, my theory that sports actually evolved as a way for people to control what we call reactive aggression and promote what we call proactive aggression, so controlled aggression. But, okay. All right. So the third part of the book, um, in, in the natural history, is about sort of the next kind of physical activity which is, uh, that we do, which is endurance. And I think this is really what humans evolved to be exceptional at. And the most, the most exceptional, the most fundamental, the most basic kind of human physical activity is walking. If you're a hunter-gatherer, uh, women hunter-gatherers on average around the world, so hunter-gatherers have been studied in different, different contexts, on average, women walk about six miles a day, and men walk about nine miles a day. And now to put that into perspective, an average hunter-gatherer woman walks from Los Angeles to New York every year. And when they walk, they're often carrying things like babies and, and food and various sorts of things. And, and, so, so there, and, and, and we started walking about seven million years ago when we split from, from the chimpanzees. There's nothing more fundamental, I think, to being a human being in terms of what we do with our bodies than walking. And yet, interestingly, walking has become very, very very controversial recently because, as I mentioned before, there's this idea that, that you know, walking is really useless for losing weight. And, and there's been a number of articles in various journals and magazines, et cetera, about how you can't lose weight walking. And that kind of makes sense because if you walk a mile, you're basically gonna spend about 50 calories more than you otherwise would spend. And frankly, that's not a lot compared to the food that you might then eat afterwards because you might be hungry, right? So, you know, a, a serving of, of fries, or I guess you call them chips, or, 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 or a Gatorade, or a Lucozade, both of those are way more calories than you'll get from walking. And so if you walk just 150 minutes a week, and remember 150 minutes a week is what, um, is what the World Health Organization and the American Heart Association and, and the you know, American College of Sports Medicine, all the, every major organization in the world thinks is the minimum sort of recommended level of physical activity you should get, that's just 21 minutes a day, so if you walk just you know, 21 minutes a day, you might lose only about half a pound um, uh, of weight. Um, and over the course of a year, that would translate to six pounds. Now, the average American wants to lose about 50 pounds on a diet, and that's just not going to cut it for most people. So it's true in a way that, you know, that the basic recommended minimum dose of walking is not very effective for losing weight. But again, that's only 21 minutes a day, and that's not a very evolutionary normal level of physical activity. If you just double that, you could lose, say, 12 pounds a year. And, and, and if you were to run or do some other kind of more intensive physical activity, you can lose even more weight. There's plenty of randomized control studies, and I go over all of them in the book. There's lots and lots and lots of references. You can lose more weight uh, simply by exercising. And it's not true that by exercising, you simply you know, just sit around all day long and just and, and, you know, recoup all the, all, the, all, the, all the energy you spent with, with Gatorade and, and donuts and stuff. It turns out you don't. But even more importantly, Walk, walking or any other kind of physical activity is really important for preventing weight regain because most diets fail not in terms of losing weight initially, but in terms of the fact that people tend to regain the weight afterwards. So here's a very famous experiment that was done here in Boston actually on policemen. They put the policemen on a 12 week diet. Some of them just dieted, some also exercised. And the one who exercised, excuse me, an eight week diet, excuse me, um, uh, actually also uh, lost a little bit more weight. But then afterwards, the ones who were exercising kept the weight off so after they stopped dieting, and the non-exercisers generally regained the weight. And this has been shown in plenty of other studies. So, so perhaps the most important thing about exercise is not so much that it helps you lose weight really rapidly, it doesn't, but that it helps you keep, prevent you from gaining weight in the first place or regaining weight after you've lost it. So walking is fundamental, but I've argued in my, in my research that running is also really fundamental and an important part of, of physical activity and that we evolved to run millions of years ago in order to hunt. Um, but yet uh, a lot of people are very worried about running and they're wary of running because it's because there's this kind of general kind of consensus out there or, or, or idea out there that running is bad for your knees. 